This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 307 was recorded on January 20th, 2022. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better serve the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by Masterworks, the billion-dollar alternative investment platform that lets you invest in art by legends like Warhol and Picasso for a fraction of the cost. Macquarie Chief Macro and Asia-Pacific Strategist Victor Schwetz returns as this week's feature interview guest. We'll touch on inflation and then move on to what's driving various macro asset classes around the globe. Then be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment when Patrick's chart deck is titled Equities, Oil, Gold, and More. And I'm Patrick Ceresna. Eric, let's jump straight to that S&P 500. Uh, the last couple of weeks have been pretty tough. I mean, we're almost 300 points off the highs. I want to talk about this when we get to the uh, post game. But uh, what's your take on these markets? Is there more risk here? Patrick, I think this is a critical moment to watch very carefully. I don't know which way it's going to resolve, but to really see why, we need a chart of the S&P Continuous Futures contract showing the 100-day moving average. We're going to have that in the post-game segment, so I'm going to save a lot of the commentary for then. But the gist of it is, look, if you think that buy the dip is the thing to do, you got your buy the dip signal. It was this morning. The close yesterday below the 100-day moving average. Every time that's happened since the March of 2020 low, it's always been bought. It's always recovered. So if that's going to play out this time, you should have bought this morning and it's all uphill from here. The thing is, there's also the possibility that it's not a buy the dip moment and that this settlement below the 100 day moving average is an ominous sign of what is to come. Okay, which one is it? Well, of course, that's always the, the hard decision to make in investing. Let's save this and come back when we can look at it in the post game segment with a chart to reference. And I'll explain why I think it's really important to watch this. I wouldn't be surprised if this is just a dead cat bounce. But as we're speaking before the close now on Thursday afternoon, we're back above. Oops, no, we're not. We were above that 100-day moving average. We got all the way up to test the five-day moving average intraday. But as we're speaking, coming up on 2 o'clock on uh, Thursday afternoon, we're back below it. And I won't be surprised if we close below it and if there's further downside to this market. But this is the kind of moment where we're going to find out. It's make or break point for the S&P. Let's see what happens. All right. Well, let's move on to the dollar index. Last week, it was uh, having a tumble uh, down toward uh, and even temporarily below the 95 level on the Dixie. Here we are mostly rebounding and the dollar's been kind of making its way back up a little bit. Was that en enough uh, dollar weakness? Uh, what, what's your take on the dollar? I really don't have any take on the dollar until we see a significant sign that there's a real trend in play. Right now, we've just been consolidating for a long time now, between 89 and 97 or so. Uh, we were holding 96 on the Dixie. That broke, but then 95 held, and we've rallied almost back up to the 96 level. So no change in outlook for me, Patrick. All right. Well, let's move on uh, to crude oil because it just doesn't want to quit. I mean, we're now um, uh, like a, a month plus into this rally and $20 higher, pushing higher highs. Uh, when does this stop? Well, I don't think it stops anytime soon, but boy, we're overdue for some kind of pause or pullback. And I think even that pause or pullback might be delayed. I'll explain why in just a minute. But let's start with EIA inventory, which came in with a small build this week of half a million barrels of crude oil. Cushing, Oklahoma, which is very critical because we're running pretty darn low on inventory in Cushing, was drawn down by 1.3 million barrels. We don't have the excuse this week that we had last week of the Keystone Pipeline having been offline. So we are seeing that pattern of drawdowns in Cushing, which is already at dangerously low levels. Gasoline was the big build on the board at 5.9 million barrels, distill it's drawing down 1.4 million barrels, U.S. production unchanged at 11.7 million barrels. Now, there's a strong argument that, hey, when you get to the double top, when we get to the same level 
which is right around 85 spot 40 or spot 50 or so, whatever it was back in October. You know, it's time that that double top should at least cause a pause to the rally, if not bring on a modest correction. Okay, we didn't see that. We saw the tape basically slice right through that previous high and keep going higher without the slightest bit of pause. What's going on there? Well, the time spreads really tell the story. And let's save this for the post-game segment when we've got a time spread chart that I can explain this with. But basically, there's renewed fears of Cushing, Oklahoma going dry and not having enough oil in physical inventory to settle the March contract, which expires in the middle of February. That's what I think is driving a lot of this upside price pressure and and that's why we've seen this relentless rally. So far, that is continuing. Let's save the uh, rest of the discussion for the post-game segment when we've got a chart to talk about it. All right. Well, let's uh, touch on gold. It's uh, uh, working its way higher here throughout the week, and it was a pretty strong day yesterday. Uh, is this a big breakout in gold in your mind? Well, finally, it looks like a big breakout in gold. But how many times have we said that before in the last six months or last year on this gold chart? We've got a breakout. We're above that 1830 critical resistance that we've been struggling to get above for more than a month now. And it looks pretty good. We've got a, a full candle today outside or above of all that noise at the short-term moving averages and below 1830. The, the whole candle today so far is well above those previous resistance levels. That looks like a real honest-to-goodness breakout. <laughs> How many times have we seen what looked like an honest-to-goodness breakout in the gold market end up turning into a fake break and reversing lower? So I'd like to see this sustained for a few days before I believe in it. And particularly, if we can get above 1880 and stay there, then I really feel like we've got confirmation that the bull market is on. But for now, I'm a little bit skeptical. All right. Well, let's touch on that 10-year treasury yield because uh, that move higher in rates that started at the beginning of the year, uh, it looks like the oil chart. It's just ripping higher. We're making 52-week highs uh, or above those uh, 2021 levels. And uh, is 2% coming here? What's going on? Well, I've got the popcorn warmed up and I'm in the edge of my seat watching this. But to be honest, I think uh, I'd rather be just be honest and admit that I think the fixed income picture is too difficult to decode or it's above my pay grade anyway. And the reason I say that is we've got so many moving pieces in the form of monetary policy, fiscal policy, what's going to happen with the pandemic switching and moving into the endemic phase, what's going to happen with fiscal policy, what's going to happen with the general attitude around government government stimulus. There's so many moving pieces here that I can't decide what's going to happen next. I'm just watching carefully. But we are at the point here above one spot 80 on the 10-year yield where we're in the danger zone. It's time to watch carefully as to what happens next. Well, this week's feature interview guest is Macquarie Asset Management's Chief Macro and Asia Pacific Strategist, Victor Schwetz. Now, Eric, why did we get Victor back on the show? Patrick, I'm particularly excited to have Victor back on the show this week. And the reason, quite frankly, is because Victor and I differ a little bit in our worldviews and our ideology. And one of the things that I know about investing in general and macro investing in particular is all of us are vulnerable to allowing our own ideology to skew our judgment. You know, I'm the kind of guy, I'm at an age where I don't believe in this universal basic income and MMT and so forth. I think that giving universal basic income, although it obviously is well intended, actually has an adverse consequence. And I, 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 I pity people who are recipients of universal basic income because I think it undermines the fundamental purpose of the incentive system of capitalism. So we're no longer incentivizing working to get ahead. We're incentivizing screwing off and collecting government transfer payments. Uh, you know what? That viewpoint, although it's very common in my generation and my age group, has very much fallen out of favor with the larger population. We're not going to do this my way going forward. We're going to do it the way society wants to do it. And that's very much leaning toward universal basic income, MMT, transfer payments, and more government stimulus and larger government. So it's important to have a well-spoken, knowledgeable honest to goodness macro expert, not just some blogger out of nowhere, but somebody who really knows what he's talking about, who shares those views that I don't happen to agree with, because those are the views of where the world is headed, whether I like it or not. Victor Schwetz is a guy who believes in MMT, who thinks that we ought to have universal basic income. And to hear a 
really seasoned macro professional with those views, I think, is very, very powerful, especially for people like myself who don't share his worldview. So I really enjoyed this interview. I think you will as well. Eric's interview with Victor is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. If you listen to just one podcast per week, stick with Macro Voices. But if you can listen to two, tune into Smarter Markets by Abex Technologies. Join us for the remainder of January as we kick off the new year with our series, What Are Smarter Markets? Hosted by Grant Williams and featuring Jeff Curry, Head of Commodities Research for Goldman Sachs. Future episodes will feature Abex founder and CEO Josh Crum, as well as yours truly, Eric Townsend. Smarter Markets brings you the entrepreneurs, icons, and executives of commodities, capital markets, and technology to rant on the inadequacies of our systems and riff on ideas for how to improve them. Our weekly episodes explore how technology can be leveraged to redesign and improve markets to meet society's biggest challenges, including energy transition. Join the conversation on Twitter at Smarter underscore Markets. And now, with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Victor Schwetz, head of global and Asia-Pacific strategy for Macquarie. Victor, it's great to have you back on the show. Last time we had you on, the episode was titled The Inflation-Deflation Pendulum. And at that time, there was still a huge amount of debate. A lot of people thought there was going to be no inflation. And of course, sure enough, we've gone from a situation where everybody questioned whether there was ever going to be any inflation to a lot of people now think it's running away and it's, it's just it's going crazy from here. Is it still a pendulum? And where are we in this story? Yes, Eric, I, I still believe we are in a pendulum. Um, I think the last time we spoke, uh, and I tend to look more at G5 inflation, which is US, UK, uh, Eurozone, Japan, and China, which is much more representative of a global inflationary climate. I think I was arguing that inflation will peak at the very end of 21, early 22, uh, at around 4%. Now, we now have December numbers, and it actually in December was 4.5%. So did we have a much more significant surge? Uh, the answer is yes. That particularly applies to the U.S., uh, to a lesser extent the U.K., but we did have a much, much stronger sort of uh, jump in inflation. The question, however, is why do we have inflation? Uh, I usually tell, ask people, were you really concerned in December 2019 that we're going to run out of people. Were you really concerned in December 2019 that suddenly we will have shortages of goods? Uh, Well, the answer, you did not. And if you think of real global demand, uh, it's only slightly ahead where it was at the peak of December 19, more so in the case of the US, less so in in other countries. But what actually happened? Uh, We had a collapse in recovery. Now, that recovery mostly shifted towards goods. Depending on a country, the goods demand is about 10 to 20 percent higher than what it was prior to uh, prior to COVID. So if you think of the trend line, we're about 10, 20 percent higher. But if you look at services demand, it's about 10 percent lower than at what is in the past. So it's not necessarily that we have explosion of demand. Rather, we had a significant relocation of demand between goods as well as services. Uh, and so as a result, we suddenly start running out of truck drivers. Our warehouses are bulging. Uh, suppliers could not properly estimate what demand will be. And so they are either underinvested or they got out of business or they were hoarding. And so the result was, uh, to me, that most of the inflation we have experienced is still the case that demand and supply curve have not moved in tandem or in unison over the last uh, couple of years. And so the question becomes, as we go forward, uh, do you think that's going to happen or that's going to get fixed? Now, if you think of most numbers, whether it's New York Fed, a global supply index, whether you look at ISM indexes globally, including U.S., What you started to see is some easing of pressures uh, around November, December. It really peaked, looks like, around October. Now, nobody could argue that if suddenly we have another COVID or we have another set of disruptions, it can get worse. But uh, at this stage, it looks like it's starting to ease. So the question to me, as we progress through 2022, 
yes, G5 uh, inflation was higher. As I said, it's, I think it's going to peak at around four and a half. Uh, I don't think it's going to go much higher. Uh, the core inflation is about three. I think it's going up a little bit more in the next couple of months. But beyond that, it really comes down to the fact, can we get demand and supply curves moving relatively in unison? Uh, my answer is yes. And I think the last time I spoke on your program, uh, I was saying by the middle of 22, a lot of supply and demand issues should get much easier. And by the end of 22, we're going to get surpluses of goods uh, rather than shortages. The only exception to that will be anything to do with digital economy. In other words, copper, lithium, uh, rare earth, semiconductors. Uh, but most of the other things, uh, I believe, uh, will more likely to be in surplus by the end of 22, earlier uh, 23. The other big question mark is that uh, can you continue stimulating demand? That's when you go to fiscal and monetary policies. And my view remains the same, that we've picked in a fiscal support Around July, August of 2021, we've already been coming off for about six months. But that sort of erosion will accelerate as we go through 22 and 23. Pretty much every country wants to control their deficits, wants to control their debts. So if you think of, again, G5 economies, we peaked at about 11 12% fiscal deficits in 21. That's going to be down to maybe around 6% in 22 and maybe closer to 5 in 23. Now, that's the biggest fiscal contraction since World War II. And unless something terrible is going to happen, I think that contraction will, uh, will, be, will be real. Nobody is going to go for primary surpluses. Nobody is going to be doing crazy stuff that we used to do. Uh, but nevertheless, fiscal delta will be, remain very negative. And the same applies to monetary delta. Almost every central bank is now believing that they are behind the curve, which I disagree with. But nevertheless, that's what they feel. And so monetary delta will be, re uh, will be declining exactly the same time as a fiscal delta. And so without fiscal and monetary uh, support, without really cyclical recovery the way we had in early 21, I think both reflation and inflation will start coming off. And so both growth and inflation at the end of 22 will be lower than at an earlier part of the year. Uh, now, how far lower? Uh, I think G5 will end up with probably around 2% down from 45 Even more inflationary countries like US and UK probably will have inflation at least three, 400 basis points uh, lower. Now, how can we go wrong on this thesis? Well, a couple of things can go wrong. Number one, Supply and demand curve don't move together. There are other disruptions, things happen, uh, and you just can't get ahead of the curve, just like we couldn't in 21. The other problem will be if central banks, as inflation persists into early 22, uh, just overdo things. In other words, they really commit a sequence of policy errors that will very quickly extinguish both growth and inflation at the same time. Uh, and the third area is really external factors uh, we did, that we can't control. Things like geopolitics. Nobody is factoring in right now anything to do with Russia versus Ukraine uh, or South China Sea or anything else. So to answer your question, Eric, I'm still in a pendulum. I'm basically arguing that without public sector, without strong fiscal and monetary support, disinflationary forces are stronger than inflationary. And so if you remove those props, inflation will go down, uh, growth will go down. And, and the question that becomes really whether you should be start stimulating again into 23. Wow, there's a lot to unpack there from the geopolitics and everything else. Let's start, though, with monetary policy and its relationship to the stock market. We have a situation now where the Federal Reserve has signaled very clearly that their intention is to taper asset purchases, eventually reduce their balance sheet, and so forth. Now, the last time this happened in 2013, it was the so-called taper tantrum, where the stock market basically you know, started to move down dramatically uh, until the Fed kind of changed their tune. Now, this time around, Victor, it seems like we're not having any taper tantrum of the stock market. Some people think that that just means market participants have become too complacent. How do you interpret this? Why is it that this time around, the Fed's talking about doing things that in the past would have been very negative for the stock market, but you know, we're only a couple of weeks off of all-time highs and not that far down from them? Well, uh, there are two or three questions here. Um, Number one is uh, one of the key elements is really uh, equilibrium rate or natural rate. 
In other words, what Federal Reserve is trying to do, and they describe it as being guided by the stars, one of the things they're trying to do is to identify what is a neutral rate, which is neither stimulatory nor significantly contractionary, uh, that keeps economy in balance without generating inflationary pressures. And one of the things we have seen over the last 30 years that U.S., Eurozone, everybody else, uh, really our star uh, or equilibrium rate has come down dramatically. In the case of the U.S., anywhere from 55% or so, 500 basis points, to close to zero today. If you think of uh, Eurozone from 35 4% to probably negative 100, 150 basis points. So right now, right now, interest rates are deeply negative. Even if you look at the 12 months moving average uh, CPI rather than um, monthly numbers, or even if you look at, uh, <clears throat> say, five by five break even rates, you still are deeply negative in official terms. And so the result is that real rates are lower than equilibrium rates. And so the result is that still supports asset classes. What happened in 2007, 2008, as well as in 2013? Uh, is that real rates moved way way above the equilibrium rates. And that's why you had a collapse of asset prices very quickly. So right now, there is still a room to move. And, and the question then becomes, how many moves can we do? And nobody knows the answer. I, I mean, there will be all sorts of things, uh, you know, broking investment houses will be telling you our strategy has got a black box and he come up with a number, which is 2.13 or 2.25 or whatever. Everybody will try to guess what that break point is, but there is a break point, and that break point is determined by our star. And because our star is not observable, you can't put it on your Bloomberg screen, it's estimatable, and, and it's very hard to ex- be exactly certain where are you relative to this neutral rate, which Federal Reserve will try to, will try to maintain. My personal view remains that we are highly financialized, we are highly leveraged, we are totally committed to asset prices as a cue to every decision we make, which means if you start coming close to our star, asset prices will collapse. And as a result, our Federal Reserve and other central banks will have no choice but to backpedal. Where are you going to see the tension? Uh, the first area will be interbank market and a repo market. Then it's going to flow through into the high yield markets and high yield spreads. After that, it will flow through into emerging markets uh, and then much more broadly into high grade uh, and equities. That in turn will be captured by the liquidity ratios that uh, Federal Reserve and other central banks use, whether you look Goldman Sachs ratios or Kansas Fed or St. Louis Fed, doesn't matter. They're all using the same variables. And so as soon as you see this tightening of liquidity starting to happen, you can almost guarantee that an army of governors of Federal Reserve will emerge out of the woodwork and start changing the narrative uh, of what Federal Reserve is trying to do. My personal view is that maybe they'll get away with two or three tightening cycles. Uh, They will certainly taper. Maybe they will try to avoid flattening of the yield curve. Because right now, 5 by 30 is really touching 50 bips, which is unbelievably flat long-term yield curve. In order to avoid some of that flattening, maybe they will do some QT. In other words, they'll physically use a balance sheet rather than just rates. But at the end of the day, uh, we are financialized, we are leveraged, which totally dependent on asset prices and the public sector, which means your room for maneuver is incredibly, incredibly narrow. And so all of those guys suggesting six star cycles, seven cycles, eight cycles, they must assume that private sector returns to its bigger and it no longer requires public sector and economies can run on their own. To me, uh, that's a big assumption. And I think it's an incorrect one. Victor, you mentioned that we already have deeply negative real interest rates. And I want to pick up on that because a lot of people forecast that outcome several years ago. And what they said is that in an environment of extremely low nominal interest rates, we'll eventually have a return to inflation. That will push us into negative interest rates. And the sure, certain, absolute outcome from that is the price of gold has to double. Well, They got the prediction right about what was going to happen with interest rates, but gold hasn't gone anywhere. What was wrong with the logic? Why hasn't it worked out the way they thought? Well, I think gold fulfills a variety of sort of objectives or criteria. Uh, One of them is inflation. The other criteria is that um, geopolitical and social dislocation 
Uh, the other criteria is economic dislocation. And so I think what was happening, the market is very much focused on recovery. They try very hard to focus on value and cyclicality. They try very hard to focus on mean reversion. And they're not yet thinking so much about geopolitics. They're not thinking so much yet about social dislocation, political dislocation. Yes, rates are negative. But on the other hand, I think more people are looking more for recovery. Uh, they're debating whether we're in the earlier part of the recovery cycle, mid or the end of the recovery cycle. People are debating how much pent-up demand is there in the marketplace, what are the excess savings uh, that have been accumulated, and how those excess savings are going to be unleashed. From my perspective, there is no excess savings. There is no pent-up demand. Cyclical recovery already occurred, and geopolitical and political tension will increase, which means gold, theoretically, should do better. But that, to me, at least explains why gold has moved. Now, a lot of people debating the role of cryptocurrencies and whether they actually substituting for gold. Uh, I don't see the evidence that cryptos are used primarily or even necessarily uh, as inflationary hedge. Let's go back to talking about what we can expect from monetary policy. I, for one, think that the pandemic is about to transition into an endemic phase. I think that the Omicron variant is going to be the thing that essentially moves this crisis from its pandemic to its endemic stage. And I think the economy is going back to normal in the next six to 12 months. Let's suppose for sake of argument that I'm right about that. I got to tell you, Victor, I can't decide whether that's good or bad for the stock market because the obvious, you know, intuitive seems like it makes sense conclusion is, well, if one of the worst things to happen to humanity in, in decades, if not a century, is finally ending, that's got to be good. But hang on. It was the government stimulus in reaction to this crisis that seems to have propelled markets much higher than they were before the crisis. So for all I know, that means that the world getting better. You know, if the if bad is the new good, then maybe good is the new bad. So does the market go down? And for that matter, should I be anticipating that the Fed is going to do what they say and that we're going to be dealing with more and more tightening of monetary policy in coming months and years? Or is that all a smokescreen and it's really going to be easing that I'm going to be dealing with down the road and not what they're telling me? Essentially, a lot of people assume that what went wrong over the last couple of years was COVID. Now, COVID is terrible and it's humanitarian and other disaster. Nobody would argue. Uh, but COVID has not altered the way we operate our economies any more than uh, Black Monday, for example, in 1987, altered our dependence on monetary policy or any more uh, than global financial crisis altered the essence of our policies. So, yes, COVID is an event, it's a major disruptor, but it hasn't changed the policy settings. Now, a lot of people would argue, Victor, but we had a massive explosion of fiscal spending. Absolutely. And that was a response that needed to be done because monetary policy cannot deal with pandemic. But we have not yet sort of proceeded to the next stage to argue that from now on, public sector is the only driver left in the economy, that from now on, things like universal basic income guarantee is a must. From now on, people must recognize that affordable housing, affordable education, access to broadband, uh, things like uh, affordable health care is a human right, not a business. And therefore, it must be operated and or heavily regulated uh, by the public sector. We have not yet reached the stage of embracing MMT as a way for paying for all of this. And so to me, to argue that COVID has moved us from monetary to fiscal levels is incorrect. Now, eventually, I think we'll get there because we're going to have many other setbacks. We're going to have a generational change, demographic change. I think eventually, five, 10 years from now, we're going to make a transition. But that is not the story of today. So to me, COVID hasn't actually changed the underlying policy settings. We are still very much driven by financialization. We're still very much driven by leverage, by assets, and assets prices being a cue to what we do. It's still very much driven by technology that continues to lower marginal cost. We're still driven by demographics, deteriorating demographics in most places. And we're still very much driven by wealth inequalities. Remember, 
In most countries, the bottom 50-60% of the population own nothing. And almost all assets, uh, up to 70%, are concentrated really in the top 1% to 10%. And so you could argue top 1% to 5% own pretty much everything. And the bottom 50-60% own, on a net basis, nothing. But those people must continue consuming. They must be encouraged to continue to borrow and consume. Because remember, otherwise the assets controlled by the top 1% or 5% uh, will simply collapse. And so the role of Federal Reserve is not inflation or unemployment. That's not their mandate. Their mandate is being an interlocker, effectively, between two spheres. One is financial markets and capital markets, which are five, ten times larger than the underlying economies. And the other thing is underlying economies, where normal people live and reside and cook their meals and do whatever. And so they interlock us between the two. They must make sure that those two spheres are moving in unison, or at least in some degree of harmony. And so to me, that's the essence of our economies. And that is why we relied on rolling asset bubbles to generate uh, growth rates that capital markets find acceptable, and also society is fine acceptable. That's why rolling bubbles was absolute necessity in order to preclude the R star or equilibrium rates collapsing to a much, much lower negative level. And so to me, that's the essence of our economies. That's the essence of our life. COVID did not change that. COVID contributed to acceleration of thinking about how we can use other tools, not just monetary tools, to drive the economies forward. And so from a market perspective, the way I look at it is that nothing has changed. If public sector step back in terms of uh, monetary and fiscal supports, disinflationary pressures become much stronger, uh, reflation goes away, growth goes away, public sector needs to come back again uh, and stimulate again. And, uh, And I think to me, return to normality, the only thing it will do, it will allow demand and supply curves to move much more in unison. And and that's good. It will start deflating some of the spike of inflation that we have experienced. But beyond that, it doesn't alter our our investments. Now, the other thing to consider, of course, is ESG. ESG was sort of an idea looking for something to do a couple of years ago. But now it's real. And COVID definitely accelerated our move towards ESG. Now, ESG is both inflationary and deflationary, but it's much more inflationary in the shorter term. Uh, And so the question is whether ESG policies will actually add to inflationary fire. Now, to my mind, 22, 23, 24, ESG will make very little difference to either demand curve or supply curve or inflationary outcomes. Beyond that, its impact will strengthen. Now, why is that? Well, the way people work is uh, the way societies work, is that in the first instance, you have to recognize there is a problem. Uh, And that was the issue for 2020, 21. This is when we'll start hugging each other and promising unrealistic targets. Having done that, and that will be the story for 22, 23, 24, we would need to modulate it. We would need to recognize our limitations. Uh, Can we do ESG without nuclear energy? What about societal goals without universal basic income guarantees? How are we going to do this? And so tempering it, aligning it much more with reality will be the story of the next three years. So I don't believe ESG by itself will actually make a difference. But that's a separate major topic that that is actually could become much more important as we go forward. Let's come back to that one. But right now, I want to come back to something you said earlier, which is geopolitics. I really agree with you that it's such an important issue. I just don't know what to make of it because it is such a complex topic. But the way I look at this, you know, we had uh, entire generations that were trained by governments to fear the Cold War because, you know, there's people who disagree with our ideology, who have weapons that could literally wipe out our civilization. We've got to take this seriously. Well, If you look at what's really going on, Victor, the development of hypersonic weapons is probably what's happening right now is as big of a deal as what was going on at the height of the Cold War. For some reason, general society is not worried about the fact that we could have a nuclear conflict between superpowers in our lifetimes. Uh, I'm still worried about it. Are you? And how should we think about this whole geopolitical situation? China, Russia, United States, post-COVID. I'll make a prediction that everybody had the good sense to not 
point fingers and try to blame somebody for COVID during the crisis. I think after the crisis, there will be more calls for accountability. What happened here? Who screwed up? Uh, who could have done better? And I think it's going to lead to more tension between the U.S. and China. Where is this all headed? No, you're absolutely right. And, and, and the markets um not factoring in anything for geopolitics. Ge- generally speaking, the markets always believe that politics will fix geopolitics. Uh, and, and by the way, over the last 50 or 60 years, that was pretty much exactly the right answer. And if you were far too concerned about it, uh, you would have missed a lot of opportunities. And so the question is, uh, will the politics continue to fix geopolitics uh, as we continue forward? The classic example is Russia versus Ukraine, uh, Ottawa and South China Sea on the other side, uh, U.S. versus China, uh, Europe versus Russia. And so, and so the question is, how much should we reflect into our thinking about the markets, about prices, particularly commodity prices, and, and also how much societies should be thinking about it? Now, I, I think you are, uh, you're right to argue that we become complacent. And whether it's a new weaponry that is coming through, whether it's asymmetric warfare that is becoming much more prevalent, whether it is a a geopolitical splits whereby uh, certain parts of the world do have a very radically different views how both societies, economies, and the systems must operate. Nobody wants to deglobalize. When people say we're deglobalizing, no, we're not deglobalizing. All we're trying to do is to reshape globalization to the liking of individual countries. And what the places like China or Russia want that globalization to look like is nothing like what the United States, for example, or Anglo-Saxons would like those systems to function with. So are you going to have more and more of those challenges, i.e. questioning the system, uh, not to dismantle it, but just to co-opt it and hijack it? So nobody is going to dismantle WTO. Nobody is going to dismantle the United Nations. Nobody is going to dismantle any of that. Uh, what those countries are trying to do is to hijack them and basically refashion them in a different mold uh, that is much more suitable to absolute national sovereignty, for example, absolute non-interference in internal affairs, no matter what those countries do to themselves or to other countries. Um, and so, and so that's that will get much, much stronger and harder to negotiate as we go forward. And so politics will have a problem containing geopolitics, unlike the previous five or six decades when they've done it uh, exceptionally well. And the reason it's harder, not only different countries move at different speeds and in different directions, but also people within those countries move in different speeds and different directions. This is the outcome of the information age sort of fusing with financialization. This is the difference between, you know, Ohio and New York or or London in uh, northern England or, you know, Sydney and Brisbane or or whatever. Uh, And so and so what you have, you have those tensions within the countries and you have tensions between the countries. And and that's going to get harder and harder to to reconcile. At the same time, uh, there are very narrow uh, windows of opportunities for both China and Russia to establish what they believe to be the right system, whether it's a sphere of influence, you can talk about Sinosphere, you can talk about Russian world or Russian speaking world. And right now it seems like the right opportunity for them to try to fix what they believe to be a problem. Now, again, for investors, it's incredibly hard to try to put a probability on it other than just playing commodity markets. And that's what they're doing right now. They're basically saying, okay, oil price will go up, or they say uranium price will go up. Apart from playing commodities, it's incredibly hard to to know uh, what those numbers will be. But in turn, my view is that what you must assume, that geopolitics will be just another variable added to our addiction to assets, our financialization, technological progression, demographics, extreme inequalities, you just add geopolitics. That's even a stronger argument why our economies will become much more state-dominated and much more state-driven, and therefore performance of various asset classes will continue to be in a pendulum, as I discussed, depending what the governments want to do and how much, how much they actually uh, put their, sort of their thumb on the, on the scales. 
Victor, we've covered quite a few topics here. Of course, our investor community is most interested in what's priced wrong and where are the trade opportunities here? Absolutely. As uh, uh, George Soros uh, consistently been saying, uh, discount what is known uh, and trade on what is not known. Uh, and that's, that's how you make money. Uh, because most investors, economists, commentators, etc., uh, they're a bit like lemmings. They all go in the same direction. And suddenly they move, move in mass from one area to the other. And so what's not discount? What, what is discounted, first of all? Well, what's discounted? There will be three or four tightening cycles. Central banks will become more aggressive, but not too aggressive. Hopefully, uh, we will have transition from a pandemic to endemic, which means cyclical growth will be strong enough to withstand fiscal and monetary props being taken away. Now, so that's what the market price is right now. Now, the the other what they don't price is, uh, first of all, the possibility that as inflation sticks around a little bit longer, particularly in the first several months, that central banks feel that they're completely cornered and they go much more aggressively. Now, that will result almost immediately in crushing both growth and inflation uh, and getting into steep disinflation much faster than what people expect. The other thing that is not priced is, even though I do think we're going to go from pandemic to endemic, we are traveling on the Greek alphabet, right? There is, um, I think we've covered so far eight or nine letters of Greek alphabet. Uh, There is 24 of them, right? So there is another like 15 to go. And what is not priced in is, in fact, non-endemic, that we actually do find variances that creates further significant dislocation. Remember in 21, we all were expecting that demand and supply curves will kind of start getting closer together. Uh, they didn't. And part of the reason they didn't, because we never get ahead, got ahead of COVID through 21. So the market is not assuming uh, that, that we're going to have that sort of a disruption. The other area the market is not assuming is what we have discussed, and that's, uh, and that's uh, geopolitics, whether it's Russia versus Ukraine, whether it's South China Sea, whether it's Taiwan, whether it's something else or whether internally domestic politics uh, that will make a significant difference. On the positive side, the market is also not assuming that fiscal deficits will go up. And, you know, there is a possibility they might, particularly if we have confusion on politics and policies arising of uh, more pandemic style behavior. In other words, more lockdown, uh, more interruption of trade. And that could lead you to higher deficits, including reinitiation of programs uh, that are currently sunsetting in most countries, uh, putting them back on. So all of that is not in a mix. What is in a mix? You go from pandemic to endemic. Uh, what is in a mix is monetary policy gets tighter, but gradually. What's in a mix? Fiscal or delta comes off, but there is enough recovery in endemic to keep you in a reasonable shape. Now, people are rotating into value and cyclicality, in other words, away from technology. And the reason being, clearly, they expect higher rates. The problem with this argument, we can't sustain higher rates. That is not possible. That's what we discussed about R star or or neutral rate. And the other thing to argue is that NASDAQ today is not NASDAQ 2000. It's trading at 30 times, not 100 times. And you have to separate the newcomers versus existing players. And the final thing to argue is that if you don't have a lot of cyclical recovery, if fiscal and monetary delta is negative, why would you go into cyclicality? What drives you to there? People say, well, lower multiples, but that's not a good enough reason because most value in cyclical companies don't have a pricing power. They don't have the margin power, anything like what the new economy and the new sectors have. So, so to me, that's probably what's in, what, what is out, and, and where I kind of disagree uh, with, with the market. Victor, we're actually speaking on Tuesday morning, a couple of days before our listeners will hear this interview. But I'm looking at the 10-year yield up to one spot 85 today. I think that's probably a couple of years it's been since it's, uh, since it's been that high. We kind of stopped at 170 to 175 last, uh, last cycle. Is this of concern? Does this tell us that, boy, inflation is really on? This is the beginning of a takeoff of secular inflation, or is this no big deal? Well, the, the interesting thing is that we have gone up from 1.53 to call it just over 1.8, but uh, 5 by 5 inflationary break-even rates are still around 2, 2.1 or so, right? 
Now, what it basically tells you, the market somehow believes that there is real growth coming through, because what we have seen is a rise in real rates. And, and I, I personally can't see where the growth is going to come from. And, and I think that's part of the reason why 30-year money really have difficulty staying much above 2%. 20-year money has really difficulty staying much more than 2.2%. You know, 5 by 30 yield curve uh, cannot even keep 55, 60 bips, which only occurs during recessions. So, so that's what the market is saying to us. Uh, I, I said, I disagree with this judgment. And you can argue maybe 5 by 5 uh, does not reflect true inflation. When it tips, doesn't, uh, doesn't reflect true inflation. But even if you look at the consumer inflation surveys, they all highlight that people expect more inflation now, less inflation later on. So that's not dissimilar the way the tips are, are also structured. So to me, that's what the market is saying. And that's why if you have more real growth, more and more people move into value and cyclicality because there are more opportunities to make money at a cheaper multiple. As I said, I disagree with this basic premise that is actually going to be more real inflation, uh, sorry, real growth coming through. Now, the other side of it is, is that as you increase real rates, as you come closer towards your R star, the volatility of asset prices will increase. As you correctly highlighted, we haven't seen 1, 1. 1.8, 1.85 on a 10-year since before COVID. You really have to go to the sort of middle of 2019 to see those sorts of numbers. And, and the question becomes, if we continue pushing it up, which is what Federal Reserve is doing, and what the market is anticipating uh, is going to happen, uh, at what stage is it going to break furniture? And nobody knows the answer, uh, because nobody knows where our star is, including Jerome Powell. And we are sort of niching along and trying to figure out just one step at a time, uh, just to see where it is. And as soon as liquidity collapses, as soon as all the liquidity ratios go through the floor, as soon as you have Kansas Fed or St. Louis Fed financial condition index getting very tight, as soon as you have start, you know, seeing spreads on a high yield market starting to increase, as soon as you've got a problem with the plumbing, because remember, when we start QT, this is when we're going to see the plumbing problems. Uh, this we're also we're going to see commercial banks not prepared to venture into risky areas because they no longer have the same amount of collateral that they require. As soon as we start seeing that, that's where the break point will arrive. Uh, and that is when Federal Reserve will have absolutely no choice but to retreat. Because remember, again, their mandate has nothing to do with inflation and employment and everything to do with the volatility of asset prices. And, and so... Is it 2%? Is it 2.2? I, I don't know. No, no, nobody does. Uh, the only thing you know is that there is a limited room for maneuver. And every time we do those exercises, that room for maneuver gets smaller and smaller and smaller and shallower. The only way to overcome this death spiral is to change your policy from monetary to fiscal. And as I said, there is no evidence right now that either population, public, society or politics seem to agree that that is the right answer. Victor, I want you to imagine that I am a speculative trader. My risk appetite allows speculating, as George Soros put it, on the unknown. And I want to make a bet, which is I really think, although I don't know for certain, I got a strong hunch that Omicron is going to be what shifts us from pandemic to endemic phase of this crisis. And it's going to result in the economy opening up faster than people expect over the next six months. I could be right about that or I could be wrong about it, but I'm willing to risk some money making that bet. How do I make the bet? Because I know how to do it with crude oil. I see that one, and I'm already about as long as I dare to be on crude oil. But other asset classes, I can't decide if this is good or bad for the stock market based on what we've been through. It could be both. You're absolutely right. It could be both. Now, the, the thing is, again, if we go into endemic stage, that basically implies that demand for goods will come off and demands for services will significantly increase. As I said early on, uh, it doesn't strike me that we actually have the spillover into labor market or wages. For example, there is absolutely no evidence in Eurozone, China, or Japan that is occurring. Even in the United States, most of the very significant wage increases are occurring 
in a disrupted sector. And so if you think of that way, that wages concentrated more in disrupted sectors, that uh, labor participation rates are, are low, and real wages are negative, it strikes me much more as a disrupted labor market rather than a labor market where we're running out of people. And so one of the things will happen when we go to endemic is that disruption of the supply and value chains, disruption of the labor market will become less pronounced as we go forward. Demand will shift much more towards services away from goods. Uh, there will be surpluses that will emerge. As I said earlier, I think we're going to be in surplus of most commodities and goods by the end of 22, early 23, rather than in deficits. And the exception to that are the digital or digital related commodities and products. So to me, it's still very much the, uh, the argument that disinflationary backdrop is still very strong. It's driven by financialization, by debt, uh, by asset prices, by demographics, uh, by extreme inequality, by technology. And if the government steps back and in, it go into endemic stage, private sector is not strong enough to maintain either gross momentum or reflationary or inflationary momentum. Now, that basically tells me that you should still be very much into new economy rather than the old economy. Uh, and that is why I, I, I only buy cyclicals and value when it's extremely distressed. But right now, nothing is really extremely distressed. Uh, and so I, I, I prefer still very much on a thematic area, i.e. Uh, replacement of humans, augmentation of humans, entertaining humans, uh, betting on social geopolitical dislocation, new energy platforms, new uh, transportation platforms, uh, disruptors, but you need to mix it in sort of an appropriate way. So, for example, capital goods companies are usually regarded as value and cyclicality. But in fact, a number of them are becoming very semantics because the new world cannot appear unless we build a new world. And capital goods companies are the ones who are going to build it. The same applies to commodities that you need for that new world as you go forward, including semiconductors, but also your copper, your nickel and the rest of it. The same applies to new startups that actually will operate this new world, everything from meta to elimination of factories and dark factories uh, to robotics to automation to a new energy, uh, new transportation. But then there are also existing companies today that are actually adapting to this environment incredibly well. And they use technology, they use products, distribution differently. Uh, again, some of those companies will be delivering productivity uh, five, six times faster than the frontier in every industry that you operate. So to me, and I describe it as quality, sustainable growth and thematics, it's sort of a mixture of all of that that creates a, a sort of a reliable portfolio that you can build. Now, you can bet now and again on the oil price, that's fine. Uh, you can bet now and again when cyclicals are completely distressed, that's absolutely fine. But if you want to invest, to me, that is really the only investment strategy that I think uh, makes sense. And again, that strategy will avoid some of the volatilities. So, for example, if you look at things like ARC, they have crystallized volatility of 40, 50, 60 percent. Uh, that is really not acceptable to a lot of either private investors or, or fund managers. By mixing all of those themes, by mixing commodities and capital goods companies, by mixing the new startups with it, uh, existing players who are doing things differently, I uh, could actually create a much more viable portfolio. Victor, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. But before I let you go, I want to touch on your book, The Great Rupture, Three Empires, Four Turning Points, and the Future of Humanity. Wow, what a title. Tell us what brought that book about, what's it about, and where can people order it? Well, Eric, it's, it's exactly about some of the issues we've discussed. It's about technology. Uh, it's about financialization. It's about how our economies are changing. It starts from looking into the past and saying what happened over the last 500 years. And the second half of the book, look what's going to happen over the next 20 or 30 years and how our societies, our economies, and the markets are going to change. And again, the title of the book is The Great Rupture, Three Empires, Four Turning Points, and the Future of Humanity by Victor Schwetz. Victor, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor.
Feeling like you've hit a wall with your investment strategy? Or maybe you've been burned by the stock market too many times since the start of the pandemic. What if I told you that you could invest in a resilient alternative asset class that the elite have been quietly putting their money into for centuries? I'm talking about blue chip works of art. Artwork that's outpaced the S&P 500 from 1995 through 2020. And while it used to be inaccessible to the everyday investor, that's no longer the case. Masterworks is the billion-dollar startup securitizing the once-exclusive art market, allowing you to finally add iconic paintings from masters like Banksy, Picasso, and Basquiat to your portfolio at a fraction of the cost. And right now, Masterworks is giving my listeners priority access for their newest offerings. Start putting your money to work at masterworks.art slash macrovoices. Again, that's masterworks.art slash macrovoices. See important disclaimers at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to hear Victor's views on the world. I mean, it's just, it makes you think so much about where we're heading with all of this and how the macro landscape will play out. I really do agree with a lot of his views in terms of how monetary policy will be going moving forward. What did you take away from the interview? I agree with you, Patrick. And as I said earlier, I think that uh, Victor very well represents where we're headed. Now, it happens to be a a political ideology that I don't personally relate to or agree with. You know what? What I think doesn't matter. Victor is a much better proxy for where the consensus sentiment of the, the whole world is in terms of what government's role should be in redistribution of wealth and equalizing uh, injustices of wealth distribution and so forth. And I, I think that his perspective is right on. In any event, I want to move on to our post-game chart deck. Listeners, you'll find the download link in your research roundup email. Now, if you don't have a research roundup email, it means you're not registered at macrovoices.com. Just go to our homepage, Macro voices.com click the red button above victor's picture that says looking for the downloads patrick the title slide says equities oil gold and more let's hit page two we got equities s p futures continuous chart what's going on here well, I mean, we obviously have a market that is uh, pulling back to some key averages. Uh, you uh, highlighted it in the market wrap that uh, that 100-day moving average has, has been tested in such a critical level. So uh, obviously, this is a, a really important moment in the markets, and uh, and it's going to be really interesting to see whether or not this spurs the, the buy-on-dip reaction that often comes here, right? Exactly. And, you know, if you look at this chart, you can see every time the S&P has closed below its 100-day moving average, that was the bottom. It was the buy the dip moment and everything was all uphill from there. Is that going to work this time or has the game actually changed? And the ways that the game might have changed would be, number one, I think the pandemic is ending and switching to its endemic phase. Omicron will be with us forever, probably. But we're going to switch out of pandemic mode into endemic mode. That's going to open up the global economy. I'm not sure what it means for accommodation and uh, and support from central banks for markets, but that's going to be one of the factors. The other factor is the Fed really has pretty much boxed themselves into a corner around saying that they're going to taper their asset purchases. They're going to trim back their balance sheet. And now they've got far less excuses to do otherwise because, hey, if you still had a pandemic on and the market was crashing because of the the next taper tantrum, the Fed would have an excuse to come to the rescue. They're not going to have as many excuses if I'm right and the pandemic really is ending in favor of the endemic phase. So is this the buy the dip moment or is what we're looking at in today's up candle, just the dead cat bounce before the bottom falls out of this market. I have no idea, Patrick. It's going to be really interesting to, to find out. My gut says bottom falls out of the market, but you know, I'm jaded by the number of times I've been wrong with that call <laughs> in the last 10 well, years. Well, you know what, Eric, actually, I, I do see some red flags. Uh, like, uh, for instance, you did point out the 100-day and the fact that we're there. But let's go back to the fact that November and December had a, pretty much two tests of the 100-day moving average. And typically, market corrections uh, the, you know, of those 5% varieties typically end up having about a one-month consolidation. And often, the buy on dip is spurred from there. So when we had that December Christmas rally that pressed the market to a, a fresh 
new 52-week high at the time, that should have opened the window to a rally that typically would last 30 to 60 days and have a, a solid bullish impulse. But instead, what we saw was that entire breakout attempt being completely given back, and we're trading at the same levels we were then. This uh, is a very heavy and toppy market, and the fact that we never followed through on that very clear bullish signal that should have seen that follow through, it didn't happen. And so those are, to me, red flags of, of at least topping formations that makes the market more vulnerable. Obviously, there's no guarantees of a, a, a massive downdraft, but it's certainly a heightened risk at this moment. So when we go to page three, another thing that uh, that kind of caught my eye about this buy on dip is is looking at where it is relative to the VIX. Now, typically, whenever the VIX jumps to the 30 plus level on the upside is when we typically see some really kind of fear in the markets as as options traders are grabbing options and paying up premium to, to participate in the volatility and usually see that VIX spiking. What's interesting is the last corrections, whether you look at the September drop or whether you look at that November drop in the markets, each one of them spurred a VIX that jumped toward the 30 level and more importantly, they were the similar style market corrections of those kind of 200 plus uh, market drop kind of moves. So here we have this two week, uh, you know, 300 point drop in the S&P and the VIX is still at at the 22, 23, 24 level, and no one seems to be panicking. And so the question is, is, is there, has there been enough fear? Has there been enough panic selling in order to put in that swing low? And, and I'm asking it, I'm not sure I want to make a bold call, but that's just another sign that, that maybe the oversold conditions that typically have associated with previous buy on dips may not be here this time around at this 100 day moving average. Patrick, let's get to where the rubber meets the road in terms of what you would recommend to listeners. How do you decide? We, we, we both agree that it's uncertain right now. What's the signal? Are you looking for an acceleration of downside momentum below the 100-day to tell you, okay, it's game on, this is, this is ugly, or is it something else? What's the signal that tells us which way this thing is going? I, I think the next three days will tell us everything you want because when you come to a critical level where buy on dip traders should be buying the dip, well, then it's a simple thing. Did they show up and buy the dip? If we go two, three days and every rally is failing and there's just no sign of the buyers in sight, that becomes a, a very big warning that uh, that simply there isn't the buy interest to, to reverse the market higher. And the more that people realize that, uh, that the momentum is shifted and that the buyers aren't coming in, liquidity is not there, the more likely it is that we can reach that point where people just start selling aggressively and, and hitting that bid. And so uh, I, I think it won't take more than a two, three good trading sessions to get a good feel on what's happening. But what I wanted to highlight as well is it's not just the uh, S&P that's at some critical levels. So let's go to NASDAQ on page four. And so the NASDAQ failed at its 50-day moving average last week. And here we are at the 200-day moving average, a very traditional and very well-tracked moving average on indices with the 200-day. And uh, we're more or less trading at a level where, again, we would typically see the buy and dip traders show up. And so this is in the same theme as the S&P. Will we see that this spurs a, a, a buy sequence where, where we kind of wipe out the last round of selling and get the NASDAQ, let's say, back toward 16,000? These are uh, some very important things to watch going into next week. The other really uh, important one to kind of highlight is uh, on page five, the Russell. The Russell spent almost the entire 2021 year trading sideways. And uh, there was a major support line just around 2100, uh, where every time the Russell traded down there, it acted like a key support. Yesterday, we decisively broke that key support line. Now, one day doesn't make a new trend. And if the Russell is able to uh, quickly reverse and get back above that level, then it could have just been a fake out to kind of like gunning the stops kind of move. But uh, this is such an important moment. Like uh, the Russell's already over the edge of the cliff. And the question is, is that just a, a warning sign that there's more weakness to come in the other indices? Anyway, Eric, let's get to page six. We got to talk crude. Uh, what's interesting is that this move on the upside of crude oil has just been one serious rip. I mean, we went from 65 to $85 in a month, $20 move on the upside. I personally think that it's a little too much too fast. And I did a lot of profit taking for uh, on my uh, energy stock positions. But uh, what's your take? I mean, obviously, I'm still bullish oil in the bigger picture, but is this a little overdone? 
Well, I think it's a lot overdone, but I'm not convinced that it's going to stop being a lot overdone. First of all, what's with this huge rip? It was really pretty easy to see. We talked about this even as the down was still happening, as the price was collapsing. We were telling you on Macro Voices, this is all a stupid Omicron panic because people are not paying attention and understanding that Omicron is not the threat that they think it is. And as I said before the new year, I'm super bullish crude into the new year because I think that's all going to be fully retraced as we recognize that Omicron was actually a blessing in disguise and has the potential to end the pandemic. A view at the time that I was ridiculed for, which now has become commonplace and people are ridiculing me for thinking that it's a different than consensus idea. Uh, I didn't actually notice when the consensus caught up. It's been obvious to the smart people for more than a month now that Omicron was likely to end the pandemic, probably approaching two months now before it was named Omicron. That was clear. Uh, What's happening now is we're seeing that retrace. But on top of that, the industry is very concerned about running out of oil in Cushing, Oklahoma, in order to settle that March contract, which actually comes into expiry at the middle to end of February. I think that's the reason we went right through. Normally, you'd expect as we hit that double top, you know, at the 84, 85 level, you'd expect at least a pullback before breaking through to a new high. seems like the market sliced straight through it. And I think the reason there is because of the fear of a physical supply shortage in Cushing, Oklahoma. I've got a chart coming up a little bit later on that'll show us that in terms of the action and the time spreads there. What concerns me about this is I do think it's that fear about Cushing running out of oil that has propelled us so quickly right through those previous levels. That means if they figure out a solution to this, if they get enough oil so that they're not concerned about Cushing running out of oil anymore because they've solved the problem, I think that is going to be time for a significant correction. Could be five or 10 bucks to the downside because, hey, with this big of a move up, a 5 or $10 correction to the downside doesn't even invalidate the bull trend. So there's lots of room for a big correction. I don't think it happens until we resolve this question of what's going on with Cushing inventory. Right. Uh, I did want to highlight just uh, some of what's going on in the energy stock space, uh, just because, I mean, certainly the point you're making makes a whole lot of sense. And that's certainly a macro driver that is on the short term uh, going to drive the oil trend. But these energy stocks have uh, really taken love to this. And this has been one of the few sectors that, uh, that has just been so strong throughout the month of January as uh, energy stocks rip higher. What's interesting is, uh, is while these energy stocks are getting there, on page eight, I have the um, S&P Energy Sector Bullish Percentage Index, which is gauging, uh, it's a very good gauge of the overall overbought or oversold conditions in there. And every time we've seen this bullish in, in a percentage index approach 100%, it has also spurred some sort of a correction. So it'll be really interesting how the market settles this. You're you're absolutely right. And on the short term, we might get uh, go higher because there's a legitimate squeeze getting underway. But is this now starting to get fully priced in? And really, are, is it like the, still the seventh inning? Is there two more innings to be played? Or uh, or are we already in the eighth, ninth inning of these moves? And uh, I've already started uh, taking some off the table, but uh, certainly uh, there's room for this to keep going. One of the interesting things on page nine, though, we have is uh, your time spread chart. And this is has been a, a story that you've been tweeting about. Uh, what's what's going on in this chart? How do we read this? Patrick, time spreads are a fascinating subject, and I'll be the first to acknowledge that there's more religion than science to them. But I'll tell you how I interpret this data. If you look on page nine on the left side of the chart, you see a very familiar and welcome pattern to crude oil traders, which is the prompt time spread. That's the difference in price between the February contract and the March contract, what traders call the GH spread. And the reason for G and H is those are the letters. G means February and H means March in futures trader speak. What you see on the left side of the chart is the nearest time spread. The difference between February and March price is the lowest time spread on the chart. And furthermore, as you see on the 13th in the afternoon, right around noon, it starts diverging much lower. So the difference in 
the vertical space between the yellow line, which is the next one, that's March to uh, April, and the red line is both large and getting larger. That's very typically what we see going right into options expiration, which was on Friday the 14th. But what you see on Friday the 14th is right around 9 a.m., which is when the U.S. market opens, all of a sudden, that red time spread, that's the difference between the February and March contracts, all of a sudden, that starts rocketing in the opposite direction of what you normally see on options expiration day. Normally, that would be collapsing to the downside. It's going straight up to the point where a couple days after OPEX, uh, yesterday on the 19th, that spread went rocketing straight up through and became at the very top of the stack. It hit a dollar thirty uh, last night. Wow, super high. What's going on there is the market is putting an extremely high premium on February oil over March oil because they're afraid of running out of March oil. Now, this GH time spread that you see at $1.12 here, after this snapshot was taken, that thing went all the way down to the mid-70s and then back up again into the, the high 80s, which is where it is right now. So what it's telling us with these elevated spreads is that the industry is scared of running out of oil in Cushing in February when it's time to settle the March contract. The red spread, the GH spread, was the best proxy for that. Going forward, the HJ spread, the yellow one, is going to be the proxy for that risk or fear factor. And as you can see, it's already breaking away from the pack of other spreads and moving higher. Does that continue? Well, if you could see this chart going a little bit later into the afternoon, both GH and HJ took a nosedive, but then they recovered. So the market is trying to figure out. Do we really have a Cushing running out of oil in February risk or not? If we do, what's the solution? Well, high prices. If the, there is a problem, the way it will be resolved is that HJ spread, the yellow spread, will blow up to the upside, and that creates the financial incentive for more people to deliver more oil into the market sooner rather than later. So that's what's going on with the spreads here, and I think that that's also because there's that tightness and that fear of running out of oil, that it's probably what's driving this very, very uh, aggressive upside move in the flat price. If you see the yellow and purple spreads start to collapse to where they become not only the bottom of the, the stack here, but they start going down to 70, 60, 50 cents, uh, you know, getting down below 50 cents, that means fear is coming out of the market and it portends that probably the flat price is about to enter a big correction as well. Well, thanks for the explanation, Eric. Uh, that makes a lot more sense now. Anyway, uh, what I wanted to just uh, finish up on the chart deck, I wanted to touch on gold and some bonds. And so we were talking about it in, during the market wrap at the beginning, that little breakout in gold. And what's interesting is the breakout did happen on gold. It is much stronger on silver. And when you look at uh, gold miners on page 11, they also had a breakout. Uh, one thing that I always say at Big Picture Trading is uh, one day does not make a new trend. And you really did highlight the key is that every time we've seen gold and silver do these breakouts, often they were faded. And uh, I think that's the single biggest thing to watch here in the coming week is will the gold bulls now gain some traction and start to follow through on this breakout or is it completely faded and we back into the trade ranges? It's got to be the thing to watch next week. What is though interesting about the gold miners is I also figured up a look up that bullish percentage index on the gold miners uh, the way we did on the energy um, uh, stocks. And what's interesting is that the gold miner percentage index is in the almost exact opposite situation as the energy stocks, which is it was quite oversold, definitely at the bottom end of trade ranges where typically we have seen bottom over the, uh, bottoms over the last five years. It'll be really interesting to see whether this turns because from a, uh, from a sentiment and from a bullish percentage index basis, uh, this uh, is looks like the bottom end of that range. And it'll be interesting to see whether a new opportunity emerges there. I agree, Patrick. I don't know if this is the turning point or if it's still yet to come, but when we see a clear turning point in the metal, boy, the, the stocks have plenty of room to catch up because the miners are very depressed and uh, there, there's plenty of room for them to make a big move to the upside. The reason they're depressed, well, gee, we, we've been talking about why the fundamentals were in place for a big, big, big gold market for like five years now, and it hasn't quite materialized yet. If we see that start to materialize and we get a sustained move in the price of gold itself above 1880 and it's accelerating to the upside from there, I think you see a huge turnaround of the mining stocks very, very quickly. 
But let's move on to the 10-year yield on uh, page 13. Boy, hitting a fresh new high there in yield. One spot 90 briefly on the 10-year. Boy, what does this mean? Well, listen, uh, I just put this as a reference point, to be honest. You already referenced the uh, the 10-year during the market wrap. What, what we generally have seen, and what, one of the things that I wanted to highlight was, you know, Victor was talking about those credit spreads on corporates, and I and I actually completely agreed with him. I wanted to uh, highlight them in the chart deck. Uh, so the 10-year yield's been pressing higher, but so has been the two and the five-year. Well, in those shorter duration ones do have a very big influence on corporate debt because the, the, of the duration matter matching. And uh, one of the things with this breakout in that 10-year yield on the upside, it's been driving weakness generally in uh, corporates. But what is interesting is that we have not seen any movement in the credit spread. So when we look on page 14 and 15, 14 is the investment grade corporate um, bond yield credit spreads. And on page 15 is the high yield junk bond credit spreads. And what's interesting is that we really do not see uh, risk or nervousness yet emergent in this and uh, and just like Victor highlighted you know as liquidity tightens it'll be really interesting to watch these sort of as a canary in the coal mine when when do we start seeing uh, these markets start to get nervous about things and start commanding um, a premium on these spreads and I think that's certainly going to be one of the more interesting things to watch throughout the rest of the year. Well, this chart on page 15 absolutely fascinates me, Patrick, because if you look at this chart without really understanding the context of what it means, it sure looks like the normal condition is a spread of about 4%. Something crazy happened in the beginning of 2020. Well, yeah, there was a global pandemic, and it went all the way up to a crazy 11% premium. You know what? It's backwards from that. It's these are junk bonds. They're called junk bonds for a reason. 10 or 11%, that's a normal spread for junk over treasury in a normal market. We're coming off of these crazy, crazy lows, and we can only get back to normal for just a brief instant in the middle of a pandemic, and then we went back to crazy lows again. Someday, there's going to be a, a moment of reckoning where people are going to realize that junk bonds got named junk bonds for a reason, and that they're <laughs> not worth uh, you know, what people pay for them. And the, the fact... In Europe, I think there's actually still some negative yielding uh, junk bonds. Yeah. <laughs> what are people well. thinking? The ECB is buying somewhere. We'll see when the Fed gets into this market anyway. Uh, but uh, that, that's uh, it, it is, it's really interesting. But I, I do think, though, that uh, Victor is going to be right. Like I, I, As these conditions tighten, at some point, uh, the liquidity is going to dry up. And, and these types of markets that need to access the credit it, uh, will um, have to start paying up to get it. And, uh, and it should start reflecting on these uh, spreads. And I think that will uh, be a very good signal that the liquidity draining market tightening conditions are, are upon us. And folks, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading. Patrick's service information is on pages 16 and 17, or you can find it at bigpicturetrading.com. We're going to leave it there for this week's show. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better serve the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by Masterworks, the billion-dollar alternative investment platform that lets you invest in art by legends like Warhol and Picasso for a fraction of the cost. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's Research Roundup. Well, this week, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to the chart book we just discussed here in the post game. There's also a link to an oilprice.com article asking if oil could reach 200, and a variant perception piece on global savings glut is a structural headwind for yields. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. So that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate the feedback and support we get from our listeners, and we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com, and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account, at Macro Voices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend. That's Eric spelt with a K. And myself at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening and we'll see you all next week. That 
concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at MacroVoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>